Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I'm going to be talking with Roy Smith. Roy actually is my personal scout. He drafted me out of high school with the Pittsburgh Pirates. He is currently now a professional scout with the New York Mets. So he's going to share his story, what he sees going on in scouting, what it's like for him scouting at home as a major league scout. And it's going to be awesome talking with Roy to catch up with him. So hopefully enjoy this episode with Roy Smith. Hey, Roy, what's going on, man? How are we doing? Hi, hey, Chad. Good to see you, buddy. Good. Now, you are out in Chicago? Yep, I'm in Chicago now. Just um, hoping, you know, wishing I was at the ballpark. <laughs> now, you have been, uh, to kind of share with our audience here, uh, you were my personal scout. You were, uh, I want to dive into kind of your scouting career, uh, maybe even remember how and what we did when we met. Um, it's been kind of interesting when I've been, scouting myself I there's probably two or three scouts that scout in my area that came into my home and shared shared their information about the club they did their their whole spiel and they're like well you remember I came into your house right and they're like uh, no not really <laughs> there were 30 guys they all kind of blend in together um but the difference between you is you were actually one of the scouts that came to Green Valley came to Las Vegas and actually worked me out um, as you guys were trying to make a draft decision. So walk us through maybe your your scouting career and how you got started and what you got into it. Uh, well, I, I, that, that year was only my second year. I played uh, 15 years as a pitcher. Um, I finished my career pitching AAA with the, um, with the Pirates. And uh, at the end of that year, they asked me if I would, was interested in scouting. And I, you know, I was a little taken aback because I had won 15 games. I had, a, you know, all, close to five years towards my pension in the big leagues. Uh, I thought they were gonna gonna ask me to come back, but the more I thought about it, you know, I just turned 32 years old, and and I said, well, you know, I could turn from an old guy to a young guy overnight. So I I, I did the New York New England area, which is you know where I'm from, I'm from New York, and then after that year, they asked me to move out to Arizona to take the area there. So it was the Four Corners and La, and Las Vegas, and I was handed a follow list, and you were at the top of it. So um, you know, I had to drive over there a few times, watch you play. And, uh, you know, the workout you, you're talking about, um, an older scout named Ken Parker uh, was, came in, and um, I knew if I let him have time with you alone, uh, just on their own, if you remember, I, I just threw batting practice and let, let Squeaky, and I knew you would sell yourself. And Kenny fell in love with you, and, um, you know, we wound up drafting you. Yeah, that's first, for those in the scouting world. That's Ken Squeaky Parker that had been that been around for a long time scouting. Um, just an awesome dude, um, hilarious. But he's like from Mississippi, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Just got that that accent. Just has a lot of energy. Had those uh, lizard skin cowboy boots he always had on, and yep. it was just a cool experience. Um, so yeah, that's your second year now as a scout. It's 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 difficult to to be in the the right position to get a first rounder. Uh, that's kind of, you could say, the dream of an area scout. Um, so walk us through, because there's only so much you know as an area scout going into it, maybe especially being a young first, second year scout, you don't really know what's going on. So I know you told me in the past, I believe you guys were looking at myself as well as Reggie Taylor. I'm sure there was a lot of other players on the board. What, what do you remember at, at that point? It's tough to remember the other guys that were in consideration because um, a couple of things. One, it was only my second year, and <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I don't have the perspective. I didn't have the perspective then that I have now. The other thing is they, they weren't necessarily going to share um, the names with me. You know, more, more than anything, I was focused on you, what I thought you could be, and I think I would probably be, um, I, I would probably be more detailed now. Not that I, I, I would have still drafted you or, or wanted to draft you, but um, again, I. I it was only my second year. More than anything, I wanted to put the people above me in the position to, to be able to make a good assessment. Um, I, I would have been a little more confident now in pushing for you, and I have no doubt that, that you know, I would have pushed as hard. But um, the important thing for me is to get to know, was, was to get to know you, um, provide as much information as I could to the, to the people above me, and, th and then get you in a spot where they could see you. And I think, um, you know, in the end, that workout you had with Squeaky was was the was the finisher. You know, uh, I, I I say to this day, I wish I had taped it. I could have sold it as a um, 
this is how you work a player out. This is these are the questions you ask. These are what this is these are the things you ask him to do. You know, uh, I can remember Squeaky telling you to get on your knees like on the grass at, at, at shortstop and throw to first base. And I said, why did he have to do that? Because I want to see how much confidence he has in his arm. You know. And then when I was throwing BP, the, all the things he asked you to do, like, like, hey, uh, hit the run. And then he'd stop you and say, all right, what were you thinking there? What, what, what'd you do different with your hands? What did, you know, we wanted to get a, get a feel for your acumen, you know, how far advanced you were mentally. Yeah. No, and that's, that's, I would definitely say that's a lost art now. Um, there's, there are some workouts that guys still continue to do. Um, it's typically at a, a big league stadium. We have free draft workouts. Um, this is all pre-COVID. Who knows what's going to happen now? Um, but they would get those measurements. You know, you, now you got the track man and all these different gadgets everywhere where they get all these measurements now. Um, there's no time to sit there and just do what you just explained, um, which is somewhat unfortunate. Um, sometimes I think we miss on, do we really know if this hitter knows what he's doing? Does he have the aptitude to hit? Uh, does he know how to make those adjustments in game? Because um, we're seeing a lot of what I call, and I think scouts call it showcase kids. Right. They can get out, they can do the bat speeds there, the hand speeds there, but then they start talking about hitting and sometimes they give you the right answer, but you can tell in their approach and how they go about it. Like, I don't know if this kid really knows how to hit. Right. Do you right. see that? Do you see that? Well, I, I'm not. I'm not dealing with as much with the amateur players now, but I do think that because of the technology and because of the overcoaching, I think you know we've kind of, and I see it at the big league level, we've kind of created a generation of robots where you know these kids aren't thinking on their own. You know, uh, I, I see it on the mound all the time where it's difficult for a, um, a pitcher to go from plan A to plan B on the fly, and that's that's the key to, especially as a starting pitcher. You know, can you pitch around and, and still be successful on your B and C days? And that's that's when you have to slow the game down. You have to, you know, go back to the rosin bag and say, okay, you know, um, is it a mechanical adjustment? Do I do I need to change my pattern? You know, there's a lot of things people can't tell you. And just like yourself as a hitter, you know, um, mentally it's really tough for somebody to get you out of a slump other than to tell them, the, the, you know, that they still believe in you. But you have to fight it out yourself, you know. You have to be mentally strong. Um, you have to, re you know, think back to, you know, hey, this is this is what got me here. I've been successful before, um, and go and go back to your process. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I don't know that we haven't lost that a little bit. You know, I agree. Yeah, it's uh, it's just talking to hitters. You kind of see their, I think their they their spit their heads kind of spin a little bit quicker. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of thoughts going on there, and they're not quite sure how to get out of it because they're they haven't discussed it or talked about it and maybe even the lack of games too and and the fact that you know the the technology is starting to come into play when you when you you know when you came on and when by the time you got to the big leagues i know you know it was you had access to to stuff that i didn't when i was in the big leagues but you were less reliant on that so therefore you had to you, your other senses become more acute it's like being blind or being deaf Mm -hmm. You know, your other senses become more acute and stronger because of that. So you had to, you know, develop a mental, a mental picture, a mental feel of how things felt when you, when it was going good. And, and it was easier for you to self-correct because of that, I think, you know, um, and, and that's, again, you, you, you know, this is all great stuff. Um, I, I, but what I, I'm glad I wasn't, I didn't have to be as reliant on, on, uh, on either analytics or or film, you know um, that because I I know given the fact that I was walking the thinnest of lines when I was in the big leagues because of my talent level, I had to be able to adjust on the fly, you know I had to and 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 even if the pitching coach told me you know boy that's not the way to go, you know what I know me better than I know you, and one thing that was drilled into my to my head early on with the Phillies when I first signed Dallas Green was the uh, the um, farm director, and he had a lot of veteran old guys, and, and boy, they they made you tough, you know. And one of the things they drilled into your head is is you have to have conviction, you have to believe in yourself, you know. Um, a, a pitch thrown with conviction, the wrong pitch thrown with conviction is better than the right pitch thrown with a doubt in your mind. 
and they, they would challenge you constantly. You know, or, or, you know, if, if you kind of were wishy-washy with an answer, they would get on you. It wasn't whether you were right or wrong, it's whether you believe it, you know, and that, that, that they, and I, that's, that's as true today as, as ever, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. I, we talked about the three Fs before, talking about faith, right? Faith is the belief that you can actually go out and do the job. Um, let's talk about, you, you mentioned that you, for our, for our listeners, that you, you pitched in the big leagues for quite a while, uh, for a few different teams. Walk us through your story. Uh, you, you were drafted out of high school, correct? Yeah, I was drafted by the Phillies. And, yeah, uh, fairly high pick. Um, got I was in I was in Double A by the time I was nineteen. Actually, the same age as you were. Um, and then we got to the big leagues at the same age. Uh, actually, I think you were twenty one. Yeah, when we got to the big leagues, or just just short of twenty two. Um, I was the summer of my you know before I uh, I was twenty two years old. Um, I had pitched. I you know they pitched me a lot early on, so I kind of lost a little bit of a yard on my fastball. So by the time I got to the big leagues, I was a more finesse pitcher. Um, but uh, the Phillies traded me out of Double A to Cleveland, and I got to the big leagues to Cleveland in 1984. And I was up, uh, up and down 84, 85. Got traded to the Twins in 86. I was up and down with them 86, 87, 88, and then got full years in the big leagues 89 and 90. And then um, I got let go, hooked on with the ball, Baltimore, and got most of the year in uh, 91. And I finished finished up in '93 with the Pirates in AAA, and they, you know, God bless him, Cam Bonifay, who was your GM and drafted you, um, offered me a scouting job at the end of the year. I still tease him about, um, you know, not bringing me up, but he was, you know, he he gave me a whole new career. I owe him a lot. So walk us through and kind of share with us, because like me, you you had an up and down career, AAA in the big leagues, kind of back and forth. What was it like for you? say the first time you got sent down from AAA or from the big leagues to AAA, what was that like mentally for you? Um, well, every time I got, I only got sent down in season once. Um, and that, that hurt. Uh, but one thing I, I did, um, I remember I was with Cleveland and, and I was doing well and I, I hadn't gotten called up. I think this was maybe 1985. I had been in the big, I had spent half the year in 84. And I remember going to sleep at night thinking, geez, these guys don't like me. What do I have to do? Blah, blah, blah. And then it, and it struck me that the people I was trying to impress in Cleveland weren't facing me the next day. They had nothing to do with how I was going to do that day. And it was almost like a, a light went on. I, I can't control that. Right. So I'm like, okay, you know what? Maybe they don't like me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a complete game tomorrow. You know, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do really well. And I'm going to force their hand, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to think about them, you know, because they're not hitting against me. You know, they're they're not. Uh, you know, they're not getting on base on me. I don't. I don't. They don't factor in what, what what's happening right in front of me. And and um, you know, I took that attitude. So yeah, there were times when I was down, but but I I liked myself better than I liked anybody else. So I wasn't. I was. I, I was. I was never going to shortchange myself when I was on the mound. I was very conscious of. You know, look, this this can this can end overnight. I'm 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 not that good. I mean, I always I always did well in AAA because I was always I always got to the big leagues. But I knew I had to bring my A game all the time. You know, so that that disappointment wasn't going to affect how I was on the mound. And and so I'm going to give my credit self credit for anything. It might be that. Yeah. And so I loved you... it. and I loved it. You know, I I I I, 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 I was single my entire except for my last year. I I didn't have other responsibilities so but the only the only disappointment you know it was all on me you know um I, I didn't have any of those extra burdens which I, I don't think I would have been able to handle real well if, if that had been the case um so you know but once I was between those lines I I loved it you know I, I really did and I and I didn't want the other guy to beat me, you know and 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 I used to listen to guys make excuses when they got to triple a I'll, I'll never forget. I was on the bus with um, in spring training with Brian Harper, who had been up and down a lot, and we were sitting next to each other. And I was reading the um, the uh, transactions in USA Today, and some guy that had been in the big leagues for a long time had just gotten sent out in spring training by a team. And I was I was like, wow, boy, I wonder how he's going to take it. And I remember Harper said to me, "Well, we'll find out how much he loves the game, boy." And that 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 always stuck with me too, because yeah. Harp, Harp, Harp didn't have an easy way up there either. You know, he didn't stick until he was like 26 or 27. And, you know, he had put up great numbers in AAA. And it's like, 
he didn't have any sympathy for that. No excuses. You love it, you go down and you do good. You know, that's that's what a competitor does. Absolutely. Yeah, you get sent down. It's, I mean, I don't know if it's an innate instinct, but you can say, okay, crap, what did I do wrong? Feel sorry for yourself. Um, I, like you said, you didn't, ha you were single throughout your career. I remember being sent down the first time and I was, I could say I, I just, I was married, but that first time you got to go tell your wife, like, Hey, we got to go back down to Nashville. And she was, she was actually pregnant at the time too. Yeah. So, so she, oh, just, you know, all those emotions are going on through your mind and you're just like, crap, cause you want to do it for her as well. And not only for yourself, but for your family, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I used to look at the married guys and say, man, I, what a, you know, I could, you know, I'm going to get over this soon. I'll, I'll, I'll be with the guys and I'll, I'll you know, and, and all of the negative thoughts that you talked about, of course, I, I would go in the outfield and, you know, just like every other ball player, it's never your fault. You know, it, deep in your heart, deep in your heart, you know what it is. But right. to the, the guys, um, we used to call play in front office in the outfield, you know, like um, you, you criticize the GM, you criticize the moves that the manager made and how you, how, uh, how they didn't give a good, a good a fair shake and all that stuff. But you know in your heart, it's, you know, um, that, that that's not the truth. And so when I was in a position, you know, when you were in the minor leagues and I was assistant GM, I think the worst person when I went down to see the AAA team and I would talk to everybody and sometimes the guys would come up to me and say, hey, can I have a minute? And a lot of times it's like, okay, you know, where do I stand and stuff? But when they started giving me excuses, I had no sympathy, you know. It's like, hey, look, I like you, but this is what you did there. There's, you know, in the end, you, you are what your record says you are, you know. And if you have a problem with it, then you pick the wrong business. What they say in The Godfather, this is the business you chose. Right. You know, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. that. That means you accept the good and the bad. And this is, you know, I, I tell guys all the time, you know, and you've played with guys like this. They love the good. And they hate they they couldn't they couldn't deal with the bad, but you also have to love the bad too. You have to love that challenge. It doesn't seem that way at the time, but when you're all done, that challenge of bouncing back, that challenge of getting up in the morning, I'm going to be better than I was yesterday. You have to love that part of it too. Deep mm -hmm. down, even though it doesn't seem like it, you know. And there's guys that, you know, they love the game as long as things are going good, you know. And the thing we all know about baseball is it's it's a game of failure. Yeah, of course. A lot, a lot of failure. Yeah, I agree. Like when you feel like you're kind of settling, right? Where you're, maybe you're at your certain spot. And you're like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm good where I am. Um, we've had a couple players on where we, the pressure. You felt so much pressure at the big league level. You play in front of fans, prospects, all this stuff. And then you get sent down. That seems to be relieved a little bit because you, you yeah. feel like you can go relax a little bit. And then that translation would be like, well, I'm having more fun here. It's like, well, that may be true, but this is not where you want to be. We hope not, right? right. We want to be in the big leagues at the highest level playing against the best competition. Um, so we, we've had some conversations with that before. It's been kind of interesting. Um, so you played, I know you played with, I believe, Todd, uh, Burt Blylevin? Yep. Was yep. one of your what? when you were with the Twins, is there anything that you learned from him? Um, well, actually, when I got traded over to Cleveland, he was there. So uh, I think I think out of the parts, or at least parts of the eight years I was up, I, I played with six of them. Um, yeah, I, I just total professional, very generous, great, great, um, great teammate. Uh, he, he was a star, but he was down, down here with everybody else, a practical joker. Uh, but uh, the intensity they brought to every start, you know, that, that, that just by example, you know, um, you, you, and you've been around guys like that, their game faces, it's hard to, hard to explain, you know, when guys turn it on, you know it as a teammate, right. but, and, and, and as an everyday player, it's a little different, but I'm sure there was a time of day in your, in your, everybody has their own routine, but there was a time of day, I'm saying around 6.30, 20 to 7, where you started zoning in, you know, mm -hmm. where all the sitting around and all the, all the peripheral talk that ends. I got to go out. I got to do my running. Uh, maybe loosen up a little bit. I got to start concentrating on who I'm facing tonight. You know, um, uh, who can run. You know, when I'm in the outfield, who do I have to be aware of and stuff like that. And th there, you can see in the clubhouse, it's it's how you know things start to calm down and there's yeah. quiet. You know, um, and 
boy, you didn't want to go near Bird on the day he pitched, you know, and that was all the way through. But that's the truth. That's the case with most starting pitchers. You're nervous. You're on edge. Um, you're always worried about, you know, the worst thing that could happen. Have you, have you, have you done everything possible to prepare yourself? Um, it, it, like, you know, with pitchers, you're only out there once every five days. And that, those four days in between after you do, do poorly can be torture, you know, and, and you, there is a, there is a fear of failure, but it's also, you know, that, that fear can really drive you, you know, and I, I know there wasn't a, ever a time that I didn't get on the mound where I was, I wasn't nervous. And as I got older and I got to, I learned how to deal with that nervousness. I would worry if I wasn't nervous. Whereas before I, I was, I used to say to myself, geez, I wish I was better. I wish I didn't feel this. And then you look forward to it because then you know you're, you're, um, you're, you're focused in. That's part of being focused is those butterflies. And then when you're done playing, that's what you miss. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, miss that, you miss that living on the edge feeling. And the whole time I wish I would say, geez, I wish I was like so-and-so. He's not, I think, I think everybody that cares is like that, you know, and that's, you, you can't replicate that feeling, you know? No. What did you do in regards to, you said you, you felt nervous. And I, if you were to probably ask any pitcher, they have those feelings of fear of, I'm not going to, what if I don't do well, right? And they're, they're already, those thoughts of the fears in the future, right? They're already concerned about the outcome, what you're trying to do. Right. Any, so did you feel like you just kind of leaned into that fear and that into any of, you could say anxiety? I could almost give you a um, kind of an up and down. When I first signed, you know, that confidence you have out of high school. And I think when we, when we experience failure in the minor leagues, I think we all think back to high school and say, boy, I wish I had that mentality in high school. Somebody got a hit off me in high school. That was an accident. That's not going to happen again. Right. Not against me. Oh, just went right out of my mind. Well, now, now I'm in the minor leagues. And, um, you know, when I got to double, probably when I got to double A, things started evening out on me and stuff. There was one game where I didn't get a, get a, hit, uh, a batter out, you know, started the game and didn't get an out. And that played on my mind. Yeah. You know, that played on my mind. I can remember getting traded to, the, to Cleveland, uh, started the next year in AAA. And, um, you know, I did really well, but, but I was even more nervous than I'd been before thinking about that game. It just played on. And then one day, um, uh, some, of the, some of the older coaches and managers I had, boy, they, you know, the psychology that they, they could use. And they, they, knew, they knew what made you tick. And, and for me, that was Doc Edwards. He was my first manager in AAA. Actually, I played with him, played from when I was 21 and when I was 31. It was okay. my first year at AAA, and then my last year I played in Buffalo. He was my manager. I love the guy. Mm -hmm. But one, one day I'm sitting there, and I, I had come to the bench, and I tried everything, you know, warming up twice, um, going right in from the bullpen to, to the mound, uh, you know, because I would, you know, I, I, I was a slow start, you know. Then I, I realized that the best thing to do is replicate the, the first inning. Warm up, sit down, get your breath, cool off a little bit, and then, then go out. So anyway, I'm sitting next to Doc. Out of the blue, he just says, hey, Smitty, if I bet you five bucks that you can't get the leadoff hitter out, what would you do? I go, we're on. He says, okay, we're on. All right? I'm going out. Why did he say that to me? All I thought about was that $5. Right. All I thought about was, and you know what? I, I stopped thinking about the second, third, and fourth hitter. I, I, all I thought about was like, all right, I might do bad, but I know I'm getting this guy out. You know, it, it, it almost relaxed me. It's like, I'm, I'm, so now I'm in the big leagues and obviously I'm not, you know, comparatively speaking, I'm not as good in, in the big leagues as I was in triple A. <laughs> and I have to, I, you know, I'm faced to Ricky Henderson. Okay. Let's say, which I, I did a lot. Right. And in your mind leading up to the game, you're thinking if I walk him, he's not just on second, he's on third. Right. Cause that's, that's what he's going to do to me, you know? Right. So mentally, he's already on third base. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, and I took the same mentality. I wrote, you know what? The A's were great at the time. All right. They might beat my brains in, but I'm getting Ricky Henderson out. As I'm warming up, that's what I'm thinking. I know I can get him out. And I, I didn't think about Carney Lansford. I didn't think about Conseco. I didn't think about McGuire. All I thought about was him. So, you know, a couple of times I did get him out. Then the next guy, okay, I'm going to get Carney Lansford out. Now, Conseco and McGuire might take me beat, but I'm getting him out. Right. And that, you know, I, 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 I really started focusing on what was, what was in front of me, you know, and that was my, that was my way of, of, of coping. 
you know, I, w I would be nervous all the way up until about the middle of my, my warm up, and then I would go back and I'm like, all right, heck with this. You know what? These guys are trying to take food off my table. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's either me or them. And then all of a sudden, I would, I would still have the butterflies, but I, it would, it would, it would leave me a little bit. And now that competitive, you almost became angry. You know, like, mm -hmm. like, you really think I'm, you really think you can, you're, you're better than me. You know, which they were, but I had to tell myself they were. You know, <laughs> but, but, it, but it becomes a, it becomes a, 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 you know, that's when your competitive juices start flowing and, and take over your, 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 that, your self doubt. You know, but it, it took me a while to get there. I mean. Yeah. Anybody that anybody that tells you now, of course, we we played with some great players, and they, you know, one of the things I think they have all in common is is a, you know, a, an unbelievable belief in themselves. But ninety nine percent of us, if anybody that says they haven't panicked or they haven't gone into a game just unbelievably doubting themselves, and then, you know, because of that, then beat themselves, um, they're lying. Mm -hmm. we, we've all gone through that. You know, even the best. I mean, talk to Pete Alonso now, who's off to a bad, you know, a tough start for us, and you know, you know, he's going to be fine, and you can tell him he's going to be fine because you, you know, you had so many ups and downs, and you're looking at this kid's power and saying, hey, you know, what are you worried about? This, this is a slump, this, but he's got that burden on him. He's, you know, he's a young kid who's supposed to be carrying us, and we're off to a little bit of a tough start. So it's not only he's trying to get out of a slump, I'm letting the whole team down, you know, and he's got a He's got a, and, and he's a good kid, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to give him advice, but I would say the same thing to him. You know, forget about, you know, forget about the letting the mats down or anything like that. You think this guy can beat you? And I guarantee you'd say, no way, you know? Yeah, I think that helps. It. Obviously, Alonzo, Pete Alonzo, home run champion, uh, dealing now with huge expectations. That's a whole different ball game uh, at the big league level, especially being in New York. Um, so yeah, hopefully he gets through that, but that's interesting. But yeah, it sounds like to me, he, he got you to focus just on one batter on one pitch, like do that. Stop worrying about Lansford, Canseco McGuire. Let's just focus on Henderson and yeah. figure, figure out that's how, how do we get him out? So that's, right. that's great advice. That's, I like that yeah. game. He, he probably lost a lot of money there. I, when I came back after I had a one, two, three inning, he's like, all right, I owe you five. I said, no, you don't. I said, I, I owe you a lot more than that. And that was, again, that was my little, uh, that was my little mental checkpoint after that. You know, um, I, I'm worried, I'm, I'm worried about everything that, that hasn't happened yet. The part I can't control is the guy I'm facing. And that's, you know, somehow or at some point while I'm warming up before the game, that focus started narrowing and narrowing. I stopped thinking about the second inning. I stopped thinking about how deep I was going to get into the game. All I thought about was, all right, I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm getting you out. Yeah, love it. That's awesome. That's great advice. So you, so you, you had a what? Had you eight years in the big leagues? Is that roughly right? Parts of yeah. Parts of eight years. So you played a long time, and then you transitioned. You were 32 when you became a scout. A uh, couple years. How many years were you an amateur scout? Um. One year in New York, New York, New England, and two years out of the Four Corners. And then uh, I became the advanced guy in, I think, 97. Um, your draft year was 96? 95. Uh, 95, yeah. 95, yeah. Okay, so I had another year as an area scout, advanced scout, did pro scouting in 98, and then got elevated to uh, assistant GM in 99. Yeah, so you, you zoomed through the – I remember each year, like, going, you know, 95 and 96, I'm kind of – Working my way up through the minors, next thing I know, you're like in the front office working as an assistant GM. Now, was that an aspiration of yours going through as a scout? Um, yeah, I wanted to be in the office. I wanted to be, you know, uh, in development or, you know, part of the decision-making process. Um, and like most things, you think it's going to be a little easier than it actually is. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I know, and I say this to Cam Bonifay, like I said, who I, I owe a lot to. Um, as with most of us, I wish I knew then what I know now when I, when I would get into meetings and think that the answers were, were black and white. And the fact of the matter is, like most of life, most of it's gray, you know, um, and, and you don't realize, and, and, the, and, the, and the job has changed. I mean, I did, I did want to be a GM for a long time, but um, it, is a, it is an all-encompassing job. It's a, it's a bear of a job. Um, you, you not only uh, are responsible for um, all of the people in baseball ops, which I think people on the outside are, would be surprised at how many people 
are actually under the um, the GM's purview. You know, mm-hmm. development, scouting, international scouting. Um, uh, actually, the GM, the GM, uh, the, the groundskeeper answers to the uh, to the GM. The medical team answers to the GM. Um, there's so many decisions you have to make. So many people, so many people that are dependent on you. Um, and it's, and it's, it could be a lonely job. And not only you have to do your job, you wake up in the morning and you're getting criticized on the radio and, and, and the papers and everything like that, just like as a player, you know, but at least as a player, you, you know, you can control things a little bit more because it's, it's only you, you have to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. It's it, I, like you said, there's 30 teams. There's only 30 GMs like 30 assistant GMs, special assistants, all these type of positions. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a, I, there's, I think it takes a special, um, I don't know, a mindset. I probably would say a my special mindset to want to be that guy or, or that yeah. girl to be a GM at, at that level. Um, but it's interesting. Like, can you give us an example of, like you said, it was, it's, it was harder than you thought. Can you give us an example of maybe, what the day was like as an assistant GM? Well, I can give you an idea what it was like GM because um, unfortunately Cam got let go in the middle of uh, 2001 and I was the interim GM for about six weeks during the season. Um, and I, I can tell you this, and I can't remember exactly what came up um, that, that was taking my time, but I do, I do remember getting to the office in, 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 um, uh, in Pittsburgh um, um, and PNC Park, right? And I had to talk to the owner, Kevin McClatchy, about something, about a trade or something. So I got in real early, about 8 o'clock. And I wanted to make sure that I was there before Kevin got there. And I presented uh, my case to him in terms of a, a move I thought we should make. And then I went back to my office and I said, all right, I had made a list of things I had to do. And I, I, I turned around on my desk to where my phone was and I started making phone calls. And at some point, I said, maybe I would get something to eat about lunchtime. Well, it was 2.30. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then I turned around, a couple other things going on. And I was like, wow, I haven't talked to Lloyd McClendon, who was manager yet. I better get down there. I turned around, it was 6.30. I, w- I will never, ever forget that day, ever. So you forgot to eat. <laughs> I didn't eat. And I, and I, I had, usually, I usually would go down and check with the GM about, you know, whatever, if yeah. something came up and stuff. At that point, you know, 6.30 on, I, I didn't like going to the clubhouse because the players are getting ready and the manager, that's his kind of downtime. You know, after BP's over and stuff, you know, the, he, he talks to the press, he's, he, you know, talks to his players and stuff, he's preparing, give them, you know, and I, I, I will never forget that day. I just, I, I, in those six weeks, I never felt like I was trying to get to even. Forget about getting ahead of the curve. I was trying to get to even. I always felt like I was one step behind. Mm. So it sounds like it's a nonstop, um, it never ends, 24-hour job. Um, what's the, what is it like after a game? Do you guys all meet together with the manager, discuss the game at all? Yeah, um, sometimes. I, 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 uh, when, I, when, I, when I would make the road trips, um, I would always go down and check with the manager about injuries and stuff like that. And then I would call the gen- general manager and say everything's fine. But – um, generally speaking, I didn't like to talk to the manager after a game. Things are too emotional. Yeah. You know, I know t- when I was with the Dodgers for two years, I talked to um, Tommy Lasorda, and he had a great uh, relationship with Al Campanis. He was the GM that hired him and stuff. And he said, Roy, Al never, Al never came in the clubhouse. He goes, every day when I came to the park, I would go into his office at 2 o'clock. We would discuss whatever we had to discuss, a lot of the stuff that happened the day before, and then I would go down. He goes, that's where the old-timers did it. That the, the clubhouse is mine, the office is yours, but I would, I would talk to him every single day. Um, I, I, you know, the manager has to, has to deal with so much after the game, and especially, you know, just think about, you know, having to make a, a big decision in the ninth inning, whether to bunt or whether maybe a hit and run backfired on you, or you, you brought the left-hander in um, and, you know, he gives up a, a home run to the other left-handed batter, even though that was the matchup you wanted. A, you're feeling down. B, you have to pick up your team, and C, you're gonna ha- you're gonna have to you're gonna be second guessed by guys with pens in their hands that never played the games in their life, you know. <laughs> and I'm not putting down the press, but that's you know th- there's such a frustration. So yeah. I think um, 
I think it, I think it was almost more nerve wracking during the games because you have so much less control of, of, of how things can come out and then you do as the player. So um, yeah, there was uh, I, I could remember just I, I, I when when things were going bad, especially with the Pirates, I, I it, 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 the games were nerve wracking. They were. <laughs> and, but yeah. again, that but that that's what you miss. You, you, you in the, when, in the off season, you say to yourself, "Why was I so nervous about that that game in the middle of May?" There's 162 of them, but that's right. that's what makes the game great. And that's what we miss about not going to the ballpark now. You know, even though maybe the nerves aren't as great, it's the challenge of of getting this player right, of 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 making the contributions to the organization, of going through your checklist to make sure you ask the right questions, you get the right angle. Um, you know, you, you really miss that. You're now a pro scout with the Mets. Um, what does that, what does a pro scout do and how, how is that different from the amateur scout? Well, the amateur scout's going to see high school and college players and pretty much preparing for the draft every year and then spending his summers preparing for the, for the next draft. Uh, pro scout, um, and again, it depends on your relationship with the GM. I know with Sandy Alderson, I was kind of a, a point man on a lot of things and then would come into the, um, would come into New York three or four, five times a year to take part in meetings, be in, be in the office uh, at the trade deadline. Um, usually, uh, right now, I, I do the American League. So I'm, um, I would, if, if, if things were normal, I, I would be charged with writing a report on every player I see uh, in the American League. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'm called the way to focus on some uh, player that we may have, um, we may have uh, trade talks about. Uh, I may be asked to go to um, our AAA team to focus on two or three guys that we're thinking about calling up or to give a, an assessment of where the guy is in their career, um, whether, you know, so-and-so who we acquired as a six-year free agent this year, is, can he help us down the road if he has a bunch of injuries? Um, usually with, with Sandy Alderson, I would, I would go to Vegas, which is where we were for a few years, and then and then – usually before the end of April, and then I would go to New York and sit down and he would spend a couple hours just, you know, hey, look, if this happens, who, who do you think I should go to? If this happens, who do you think I should go to? Um, and then, uh, you know, the trade, the, the trade deadline is, um, is, is exhilarating on this side of it. I mean, that's your, that's your playoff game uh, as a player. You know, I, I, I'll always forget the trade deadline of 2015 when we acquired um, UN assessment. Uh, and that, that literally, that deal got done with five minutes left, left till the deadline. Uh, and that, and that changed, that changed everything. We, you know, he went on a absolute tear and, and pretty much carried us to the World Series that year. Uh, at that time, we were, we were a 500 team, you know, um, and we were playing Washington, who was, um, uh, who, who was ahead of us. We were, we were two games out. Uh, and that same weekend that we got Cespedes done was the weekend that um, uh, oh, now the uh, name uh, the kid that we had traded to Milwaukee, but the trade fell through and he wound up hitting a home run the next day against Washington to um, to, to to win the game for us. Ah, um, my my mind's moving too quick here. But, <laughs> uh, but there was it was a weekend that I'll never forget in terms of in terms of being on this side of it out of the uniform. Um, all the, all of the uh, the uh, combinations of players, um, you know, who could we trade for? Who who are we willing to give up? The, the 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 give and take between the GM and the other GM on you know the, the kind of the art of the deal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was it's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So you you specified so amateur scouts. We we scout high school players, college players, the amateur player. We prepare for the draft. You do the pro side. That's that's pretty cool in regards to people always ask, well, how do how do how do teams make trades? Like, well, so there's a whole different section of scouts that are pro scouts, meaning they right. scout the big league player and the minor league player. Now, there's been a long time where me and other amateur scouts, after the draft's over, will be assigned maybe one or two teams. I live in Las Vegas, so a lot of time I would go scout the Las Vegas AAA team. So I was assigned go watch five games, write a report on every player on that team, and then maybe go do a short season A-ball team. Um, so you, as a pro scout, you're, you're scouting the whole American League. Um, I know other pro scouts, they'll be assigned, say, the whole, the whole East Coast. 
or, or a specific organization, and then they have to go scout, say they're given the Phillies, they got to scout every Philly team all the way down from the big leagues down through the minor leagues. And right. that, that's every team's going to be a little bit different on how they attack that. Um, we, 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 use, we go by organizations, which I think is the best way to go because you, you're able to see the development of the player. It's going to give you a lot more background on the player when it comes time to, you know, whether, you know, when it comes time to maybe you, of acquiring that player. Um, and, and seeing the progression of a player is really, really important. Um, so I, I, that's, that's what we do. There's a layer below me that, that we, we go three organizations. Now, when I, when I was scouting, um, scouting you back then, uh, the pro departments weren't as big as they are now. So I actually had, I think my first year I had four or five minor league teams to do in the Eastern, I think it was in the Eastern League. And in September, I would do the two New York teams when I was living there. Okay. And then when I was out in Arizona, um, I forget who it was. But it's important that the amateur scout sees pro, not only pro ball, but big league ball, because you have to constantly refresh your mind as to what it is you're looking for. This, this is big league bat speed. This is, this is uh, big league power. This is what a big league slider looks like. This is what a big league curveball looks like. You know, this, these, for me, especially being a pitcher, one of the toughest things for me was, was middle infield play. And you were a shortstop in high school. Um, I, I, I re, uh, refer back to that workout that when we brought Scooty Parker in. You know, I, I went out to eat with him afterwards, and there was so many things he, they, he asked you to do on, on the field. And I asked why, because I had to learn those positions. Mm -hmm. You know, as a pitcher, you're so focused just between the mound and the plate. Um, what do big league feet look like? When, you, when you're scouting middle infielders, it's feet, you know? Um, and, 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 and you have to, you know, uh, look at um, a, a Lindor, you know, and, and uh, you know, and then you see a kid in a ball and you say, you know, yes or no, you know, this, this, is, this is the high standard. Um, this is what I'm looking for, you know, but you have to constantly see it and refresh your mind. So that, that's an important part of it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if teams do that as, uh, uh, enough anymore either. I know, I know there's a lot of time, there's a lot more showcases. Um, but one thing about being an area scout is A, you're your own boss. And that, and that's, that, that can be two. And I've told some younger um, scouts that, that I've got onto the scouting side just on the pro side. And you and I have talked about it. I know that my, my, the biggest the most important part of my post-playing career was being an area scout. I learned so much. And what, in, in terms of talent assessment, what seeing young players, young high school and college players teaches you is how to project and how to be patient. So sometimes, and I, you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody. There's, there's some great scouts out there. And, um, you know, you either, sometimes you either have an eye or you don't. But sometimes I look at scouts that I know never had to see amateur players and had to make calls on them and, and assessments. When I'm scouting A-ball, are they, are they going to be, you know, how do they look at the young Latin kid who's only 17 years old and he's away from home for the first time? You know, how, did they, how, how are they able to project? If you, 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 as a player, you think you remember what the other guys were like, but you really care about yourself. You know, you, you don't have a frame of reference, right. you know. Um, and that, that's the toughest part of the side of it. Um, there's so much more sample size at the big league level. A lot, a lot of what, a lot of what I do is comparison scouting. Would you have to have this guy or that guy? But, but going to a ball and projecting on a, on a young Latin, and I, I refer to Latins because they're, they're going to be a little younger because they can sign younger, um, or, or a raw kid out of high school, uh, that's got some power, but a lot of swing and miss or a, a young lean, a uh, pitcher who's six foot four and 180 pounds, you know, is, is he going to, is he going to be able to corral, you know, uh, grow into his mechanics, put on 20 pounds. That's the challenge. That's, right. that's, the, that's where you make your money on, on, on this side of it. But, but I've told a lot of guys that are young that maybe get frustrated on the pro side because maybe you have some veteran guys ahead of you that, that they're the, they're the go-to guys. And how am I going to get to that point? I'll say, Hey, Ask it, ask, see if there's an opening on the, on, the, on the amateur side. Because the GM doesn't see those guys. He may go see the first round pick, but after that, that that's up to the, that's up to the, um, the, the amateur staff. 
And then as, a, as, a, as an area guy, every guy you have on your list isn't going to crush that either. Right. And it's up to you to, to push for those, for those um, guys lower on your list. And we both know that, that you know, any kid that's drafted has a chance to get to the big one, you know. Um, so in a lot of ways, you have a lot more, um, a lot more autonomy on that side of it. And, and, it's, and it's easier to make your mark because um, the analytics guys and the, uh, the, the, the GM, um, you know, they're not going to have as much say on some, some of those guys. Yeah, that's and that's where the you know regular the regular drafts are forty rounds. This past year was five rounds. Who knows what next year is going to be? Whether it's ten, twenty, um, certainly going to be lower than forty, most likely. <laughs> so, so we're seeing things start to change. Um, we're seeing more. You you said you're at home. The, the, we're about in the middle of August at, at this recording. Um, you're at home as a big league scout scouting on TV. So what is that like right now? It's not what you want to do. I mean, you can pick up a lot of stuff. The pitching is easier, but assessing uh, assessing a um, luckily I've been around a lot, and there aren't that many players I haven't seen at least at some point uh, by the time they get to the big leagues. But I don't. I don't. Assessing defense is almost near impossible because you have to see you have to see reaction. You have to see reaction to ball off bat. You know, and and the cameras is not that quick. You know, um, so so that makes it difficult. Um, I, I, this is the first summer since I was 17 years old that I haven't out, been out to see a, a base, either, either playing in a baseball game or, or going out to see a game. Um, and it's really weird. It's, it, your body's telling you that you're supposed to be someplace else, you know. Um, but, hey, look, um, you know, we've got to the point with the technology and, and our portal with the Mets is as uh, cutting edge as anybody's, um, you know, when I when I wake up the next morning after a game, I go I go to you know the clips of the the day before segment into each pitch for a hitter or each pitch for a pitcher are going to be there for me. I'm gonna I'm gonna double check to make sure I I have uh, my my descriptive part of my report is on. You know I wrote down at the game that night that he that he had a little bit of a short arm action. Well, you know I'm gonna watch watch a couple of clips to make see exactly how far he brings his arm back. Um, uh, you know. Whether whether my um, description of of his delivery and maybe some flaws I picked out, you know, I'll, I'll look at some different angles on the camera to make sure I have it right. Uh, but I'm glad I'm glad I wasn't able to rely on that when I first started scouting because you you know um, sometimes uh, especially on the amateur side that was the only look you were going to get at that guy. So your your um, your eye for detail had to be sharper. You you had to. You had to make sure that you covered all your bases if, if that was the only guy, time you were going to see the guy because there was no going back to the computer and, and looking at, um, at film and stuff. Right. And you had to, you know, so I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't break in under these conditions. Yeah, so, I mean, you've, you've been around long enough to see these changes, right? The analytics are starting to happen a little bit more. Video is very prevalent. It, it's certainly the amateur side. We're trying to get as much as we possibly can on these players. And now you're now you're at home in, in Chicago, <laughs> scouting for the Mets, watching on TV, watching with plastic cardboard in the background, uh, the fake music going on. Um, hopefully, it, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully it's just this year. <laughs> We're praying that it's just this year. I know. Are you seeing um, trends that you're not liking in in this regard to scouting? Yeah, I, I well in scouting. Um... Yeah, I guess, you know, uh, analytics can be a turnoff a little bit, and, and I understand them and I use them. Um, but I, I always say that if that's the only prism from which you look at the game or you, uh, which you assess a player, uh, without trying to sound cocky, I will beat you because I can apply what you have and add it to what I already know, you know. So um, – you know that that's probably what bothers me the most that 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 you can assess a player just through that and again the the access to information that we have now is off the charts and it's all good stuff and it's, and I am not denying the science in any case in any way shape or form but if you want to build a good team and you want to make right decision it's a combination you know um, I didn't I didn't in forty years in the game I've 
I had to have learned something sitting behind the plate and watching all those games and actually actually having played, you know. Um, that That's not going by the wayside. Mm. I feel fortunate that I could take all this information that we have and and use it to supplement what I always already know, you know. Um, but I, I think, you know, the trends I'm seeing, and, and you're, a, you're a hitter, I think – the, you know, this one, I think we're into a one size fits all kind of era here where, you know, the launch angle swing is the way to go. Okay, I, I see. You know, it, it's helped a lot of guys. Um, you know, uh, balls in the air are better than balls on the ground. Shifts, yeah, especially left handed hitters, they roll the ball over. Most ground balls are going to be to the right side. I get it. But a launch angle swing isn't going to help Jeff, Jeff McNeil, you know, who uses the entire. You know, I, I, you play with uh, Jason Kendall. I don't think a launch angle swing was going to help Jason. Right. You know? Jason, Jason used the entire field. He was, he was a, a great contact hitter with a great eye. You know, um, take that into account. You know, I, 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 and you would have a better knowledge of this. Um, all we hear is the success stories. How many young kids are getting falling by the wayside trying to do something they, they're not capable of with, with that, you know? Yeah. Or the only, the only way to go is the four seam riding fast. <laughs> was the 14 fastball back? And when I see launch angle swings, I see hole. Okay, I feel like I I could have exploited it. Now, I didn't throw as hard. I would have had to been my my command would have had to been more precise. But I see hole. Okay, so I understand that. But I'm not going to ask Derek Lowe to throw four seam. I'm not going to ask Brandon Webb to throw four seam or, or or Scott Eriks. You know, even if they threw a four seam, it would still sink. You know, and you face some good sinker balls. You you don't let the good sink, you know. Um, so that's all. I, 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 look, I just just don't. It, baseball is 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 as as an individual a sport as there is, especially pitching. Um, and one size does not fit all. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. Well, this has been awesome, man. I, I've been wanting to get you on. You're, you're my first pro scout, um, even assistant GM. Like, we're, we're getting up here in rank. This has been pretty awesome. And it's been, it's been fun. We ran into each other a few times on the road. Um, I was actually in San Francisco for my wife's 40th birthday with a bunch of friends. And we were all hanging out in the lobby. All of a sudden, I see you come out of the lobby. And you're like, Roy, what's up, man? <laughs> you're going to scout the Giants. So it was, your wife's 40th birthday. I said, you know, whoever I was with, I said, that's that's the kid. That's the kid I signed out of um, Las Vegas in the first round. It was my first sign. Uh, <laughs> and, and then you have to drop the 40 bomb. Man, it, it goes quick. It really does. But um, it, it does. the great thing about it, is it's, it's you know, this industry is such a small industry, you know, and um, the friendships that we make, the the, the, the shared experiences, um, it's it, it's it really is uh, rewarding. Yeah, no doubt. Well, as we wrap this up, Roy, what would you say with all the experience that you have, say you're, you're going to go talk to a kid, back to the amateur days, back to this, that 17, 18 year old that scouts are starting to look at him, maybe he's a draft prospect, any advice you would have for that type of player? Play. There, there's no, there's no, um, uh, playing is the most important thing. You know that that's the that's the best learning experience. Good coaching is, is is very very important, but you know you also have to learn how to compete. You know, and beating the other guy is important. I think I, I and again you're you're involved with more than me. Have we lost the the um, the the focus of beating the other guy with all of the um, showcase type type baseball that's played? You know, I mean. Um, you know, I, I, when, when I was, before I signed to play, I, I, um, you know, I didn't sign till August. The thought of not playing on the weekends with my buddies, um, and, and I grew up in the New York area and we, we, we played mostly in New York City because the leagues in the city, it didn't matter where you lived as long as you were of age. The thought of not playing and, 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 you know, maybe being a little protective because there's still a chance I was going to go back and sign, which I did, and, and, and not you know, taking the risk of getting hurt, mm -hmm. never even entered my mind or my father's because the thrill of playing and, and the thrill of winning collectively, and, and, and we still talk about it today, and I still get a kick out of 
you know, uh, the exhilaration of what it felt like, not only, you know, going to a tournament and winning, but, but doing it with the guys, my buddies, my, my, my non-blood brothers, you know. I played in the big leagues and I still talk about that, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, learning how to play is important, but learning how to compete is, is just as important. And that's how you learn to, to, to um, deal with failure, you know. Um, going out and throwing seven innings and, and giving up two runs, that's great, you know. But it should sting a little bit if you lose two to one. The, yeah. the, the, ob the object still is to, to beat the other guy, you know. And that's, you know, that, that, that's, I, I don't know if we haven't lost that part of it either, you know. Yeah, I think with the showcase circuit, they're definitely, they're playing so much and then they're playing on these teams that they, they're all friends, you know, which is, that's, that's cool. That's fine. Um, the USA, I mean, back when, back when I played, it was area codes and there's maybe some Goodwill series, maybe some USA stuff. So it's a lot of that's the same, but I think they're just doing it for a longer period of time throughout the year. And so you, you just hope that they have that drive and desire to go out and beat that person. And I, and I get it. I, I, I would be there to perform. You know, and, and if I threw hard and I struck out four or five guys in a row in front of 30 scouts behind the stands, yes, that's, that's the important part. You know, I'm not, that, that's a huge part of it. You're going right. to sign, you're going to you know, try to fulfill your dream and everything like that. But, you know, once you get, once you get into pro ball, you know, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes, sometimes as, as, as Tom Kelly said one time, I heard, I heard him talking to the press, Sometimes you have, you know, it's not enough to pitch good. Sometimes you have to beat the other guy. Sometimes yeah. you have to hold the other team to less runs than your team. I mean, to, to less runs than your team scores. You know, going in, you're not going to get a lot of runs. You know, you know, going in, you're facing Burt Flylevin or Mike Pitney. So, you know, giving up three runs in seven innings isn't good enough. You right. know, and that's, you know, that's the, that's the challenge. You know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been great, man. I hope, uh, hopefully we can run into each other. Usually it's Arizona when we, when we catch each other and yeah. we go hit up our, uh, our chilies or whatever, you know, something real classy, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I really, I really enjoyed it. I hope, uh, hope, I hope I was able to contribute something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So man, I appreciate you. Best of luck to you um, with the, with the season, with the Mets. Um, hopefully you get Alonzo rolling a little bit here for you guys and, and uh, I certainly want to wish you the best, Roy. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chad. I enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man. Hey, what's up, guys? Hopefully you enjoyed that episode with Roy Smith. Roy, as you can tell, is a great friend, knows a lot about the game, spent a lot of time in Major League Baseball, both as a player and as a professional scout. Want to make sure that you guys are aware of my weekly live online calls. I started doing live calls. It's been great. The kids are loving it. It's a very affordable monthly subscription. It's $13.99 a month. I'm doing weekly calls. I pick a topic. I teach it for about five to 10 minutes. And then I open it up for questions. And we just start having some dialogue about the topic, about how it can help improve them in their life and in their game. So if you want to go check that out, go to mentaledge.training forward slash subscribe. But I will see you in the next episode.